Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijs and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Mary Prendergast. Mary is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Rice University. She's an archaeologist interested in the history of food and eating and in the past life ways of hunter, gatherer, fisher, and the earliest livestock herders in sub-Saharan Africa. She co-directs a field project at the pastoral Neolithic site of Luxmanda in collaboration with scholars at the National Museum of Tanzania, the University of Florida, and the University of Dar es Salaam. It together examines the social changes associated with the emergence of food production in Eastern Africa. Mary also co-directs a project that explores past demographic changes in Sub-Saharan Africa for the analysis of human ancient DNA in collaboration with the Reich uh, Lab Laboratory at Harvard, where she's a scientific associate. Please join me in welcoming Mary as she gives her talk, Asian DNA and the African Past. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, thanks uh, everybody for coming this morning from wherever you are. Um, I'm in Houston, Texas, so it's early morning over here. Um, I, I thank you so much for introducing me. I was also just going to, because I'm new to the network, give a little bit of an introduction um, of, of myself and my, my other research to you, but I think Anna's already covered it pretty well. So um, although I'm talking about ancient DNA today, uh, actually much of what I do and sort of the foundation of what I've done as a student and, and then later in my early years uh, post PhD is zooarchaeology. So I study animal bone remains as a way of reconstructing ancient African foodways. Um, and you've already heard um, quite a bit about this research already if you came to Catherine Grillo's talk on Luxmanda. So that's the site that Kate and I um, have been uh, working together at for about 10 years now. Um, and so I'm happy to talk about Luxmanda at any point, um, but that is definitely not the subject uh, of today's talk. So over the last few years, I've moved more into what one um, sometimes calls biomolecular archaeology. So that's stuff like ancient proteins, um, lipid residues, stable isotopes, um, ancient DNA, of course, is one of these things. And I, and I really came into this work from my role as a zooarchaeologist, looking at the spread of specific animals um, into and through Eastern Africa. Um, and that journey sort of led me to this ancient DNA project that I'll be speaking about today. And as a key component of that work, um, I've worked very closely with other members of the team that I'll talk about today, in particular, Elizabeth Sawchuk, um, who is at the University of Alberta, developing some protocols to do this research more ethically. So as we'll talk about sort of toward the end of today's talk, ancient DNA research has been nothing uh, but controversial. Um, and a big part of that controversy st stems from the ethics of how this work is done. So, so that's something that I've focused on quite a bit in my work. And that's led me to think about the roles of museums and curators in this research. Um, and now that I've just recently uh, moved institutions and landed at Rice, I spend a lot of time thinking about the roles of museums um, in the future, since I'm now involved in our museums and cultural heritage studies program. So that's sort of a longish introduction, but I sort of want to give you perspective on how I wound up in ancient DNA research. Um, and I always just like to stress that um, I'm not a geneticist. Um, I'm coming at this as an archeologist um, and from a very particular archeological perspective, also not a linguist and have no linguistic training. And part of um, what you'll notice is absent today from the talk, but what I would also love to discuss in the Q and A is the ways in which we can be better about um, talking to linguists and, and integrating the questions that we have um, with linguistic lines of evidence in addition to the archeological and the genetic lines, which is what I'm really focused on today. Um, so today I'd just like to cover a couple of basics. I, I realize there may be people here today who are quite well versed in genetics and, and likely if you are then more so than myself, um, but I do wanna just kind of start from the basics of what genetics does and doesn't tell us about the past. The doesn't, I think, is quite important. Um, often ancient DNA research is taken, particularly in the popular media, to be some kind of um, final word on the past, when in fact it's just one among many lines of evidence. Um, I want to sort of 
frame this so-called ancient DNA revolution in a much longer history of population genetics research um, and sort of stress that there are ways in which this is and is not revolutionary. Um, and then I'll focus on two case studies um, in the Rift Valley um, that I think illustrate the kinds of research that can be done with this very new um, approach. Uh, and then that'll bring me into the final part of today's talk. Maybe this is more we can discuss in an informal way with the Q&A. Um, what are some of the ethical concerns in this research and how can we do better um, in integrating different um, disciplines and different perspectives. So just to, to remind everybody, and I know that you guys all know this, of course, because this is sort of the heart of what we're all doing here, but genetic linguistic and material cultural patterns are telling us about very different things at different spatial scales. Um, and I just really like to emphasize that. So, you know, fundamentally what we're talking about today is we're reconstructing gene flow, and this is a very crude um, sort of biology 101 illustration of gene flow amongst birds. Um, and we all know that human social relationships that lead to reproductive sex are far, far more complicated than what's illustrated here. And so really what we're looking at when we're looking at ancient DNA is one very specific thing, which is the reproduction um, and passing on of genes. Um, and then of course the social context in which that takes place it could be highly variable across space and time and even among individual people. Um, so I always just like to stress that. We're also, because of the lack of data in, in, in Africa, working at very, very large scales right now, both temporal and spatial scales. Um, I won't tell you guys how um, uh, linguistic patterns reflect human interaction because that's your area of expertise and certainly not mine. But again, temporal and spatial scales are different from both genetic and archeological data. And at the archeological level, we, um, I mean, I get, again, I know Kate Grillo came here and talked uh, extensively with you all about the pastoral Neolithic. Um, these are two different pastoral Neolithic uh, ceramic making traditions. One is on the left. This is what we call Savannah pastoral Neolithic. One is on the right. This is what we call Almond Titan. These are pretty localized compared to the, the sort of broad sweep of genetic data. Um, and they're telling us about what people thought was perhaps beautiful, functional, traditional, uh, prestigious, right? There's all sorts of things that th these um, different material cultural patterns could be telling us and often at quite local scales. Um, and the reason I have these two illustrated is, is because these differences between Savannah Pastoral Neolithic and Elman Titan cultural traditions will come up later. Um, the other thing I always like to say, and again, I know everybody here already knows this, um, and we all are telling our students this, is that pots are not peoples. And so one thing that I think has come up a lot is that um, there's this push to equate genetic patterns, material cultural patterns, and social patterns. And we all know those are not the same. And, and the explanation behind these pictures here is that I've been teaching in Madrid, Spain for the last slightly over 10 years before I just moved to Texas and had always taught a very um, internationally diverse group of students. And I would tell them, you know, you American students have these gigantic Nalgene bottles. Everybody's like, why do Americans drink so much water? Maybe some of my European students have the classic decathlon bottle that will be familiar to many of you. And still others would, wouldn't think of drinking in class, right? They'll just sort of hold it. Um, and, and you would never speculate upon somebody's, you know, genetic ancestry based on these material cultural patterns. And we shouldn't be making the same uh, mistakes here. Um, we should always be conscious of that um, variability. So the other thing I, I'd like to do before I get into case studies is just very, very briefly talk about the fact that Although ancient DNA has been hailed as revolutionary in the last 10 years, um, it's really stemming from a much longer history of studies of population genetics and demographics in Africa and around the world. And uh, along with that, a very large social conversation, right? Um, about how this research proceeds ethically and about how we interpret these data against other lines of evidence. So I think that what's happening is our, our, the ways in which we work together are being revolutionized, um, but many of the questions are not new. So you know, even as early as the 1950s, there were studies of the so-called classical markers that the best known example that many of you will already be familiar with 
um, is of course um, sickle cell anemia and the co strong correlation between um, prevalence of, uh, of uh, genetic mutation um, causing sickle cell anemia and the distribution of malaria. So these kinds of large scale population studies have been around for a very long time. Um, and then, you know, I went to school in the 90s and early 2000s. And so I was really being educated in the era of single locus DNA studies. So these are either mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down the maternal line, or non recombinant Y chromosome DNA, which is passed down the paternal line. Um, and as you may have um, learned elsewhere, this is sort of looking at if, if you sequence my mitochondrial DNA, you're looking at my mother's 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 mother, and so on and so forth all the way back to our very, very earliest ancestors. Um, so you're tracing a single lineage. Um, and of course, one of the major discoveries of this back in 1987 in a paper by Can et al. was that um, all humans alive on, on the planet today can trace their origins to uh, Africa and to an ancestor or ancestral group that lived relatively recently. Um, those dates have now been pushed back to perhaps 250 or even 300,000 years ago. So ignore these dates here, which are a little bit outdated. Um, and, and that we all share that, that common root. And that was a really important finding. Um, it, it also um, corroborated a lot of what paleoanthropologists had long been saying and archeologists had long been saying based on the fossil and archeological records. But I think that's a really good example of a way in which um, DNA studies started to um, advance our understanding of, of the human past. Um, but what's really happened in the last 10 years especially is the shift from those single locus studies, which are looking at one lineage, again, my mother's 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 mother, to um, whole uh, genome studies where we are looking at all of the genome. Um, and, and that's just greatly increasing the power of our analysis. Um, I, I'm not gonna get into the weeds on explaining all of this in detail, although I'm happy to point to resources for reading about this, but basically, um, when you're looking at um, all of the 23 plus 23, that's 46 pairs of chromosomes we've inherited from each of our parents, you're getting at about 3 billion base pairs. Um, so you're capturing, uh, potentially capturing far more variation with whole genome studies and a far greater number of ancestors um, in a single individual than just my mother's 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 mother. And so you're getting sort of snippets, fragments of those individuals um, DNA spliced together into my genome, right? If we sequence my genome. Um, and, and so although fragmentary, right, incomplete, you're getting a far greater range of ancestors by looking at a single individual. And I think that's a really important distinction to make because we've often seen in the literature sort of a, um, a uh, elision of, of, of the single locus and the whole genome studies when they're really quite different in terms of their power. Um, so the genome-wide studies um, with, with people who are living today or who've lived recently um, really began in earnest in the 2000s. Um, probably the landmark paper for this in Africa that many of you will be familiar with is by Sarah Tishkoff et al on the genetic structure and history of Africans and African-Americans. Um, and that remains a, a, a reference work for, for many of us. Um, and then where those whole genome studies uh, really started to enter the ancient DNA sphere was in 2010. This is when we saw the first whole genome ancient DNA data being published. Um, that's not in Africa, that was initially in Greenland. And then later a number of studies started emerging in similarly cold, dry, um, DNA-friendly environments. Um, and so I guess, again, what I'd like to sort of uh, emphasize here is that ancient DNA studies have been around since the 90s, but those studies were based, again, on a single locus, right, either mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome DNA. Um, there were also lots of problems in early studies with contamination. So the first ancient DNA study in Africa, um, which was in ancient Egypt on mummified human remains, um, was later shown to have been an artifact of contamination. So that study is not useful to us. Um, 
So a lot of those early studies should be treated with a lot of caution if you're looking at them and, and citing them. Um, and, and so should our studies, obviously, but, but a lot of the contamination issues have been controlled for. Um, and um, we are now looking at these sort of mosaic tiles, right, of the whole genome, um, where we're potentially looking at thousands or tens of thousands of ancestors um, by analyzing the genome of a single individual. So we have a lot more analytical power. Um, so with this shift from single locus to whole genome studies, and with the improved technology um, for, for sequencing ancient DNA, and I should also say with the discovery, I think this may have been on my slide and I forgot to mention it, or maybe it's coming up, um, with the discovery of the Petrus portion, that the Petrus portion of the temporal bone in the skull preserves more DNA than other parts of the body, right? That discovery came in 2015. Um, ancient DNA research really began to flourish um, and the number of laboratories doing this work multiplied. And this is now an old map. Um, I would love to see a more updated map. I've, I've not been able to find one nor found the time to make one myself. Um, Austin Reynolds had done this one and I think it's really useful for underscoring just how unequally distributed the resources regarding this research are. So not too surprisingly and reflecting many of the other sciences, ancient DNA, it is incredibly um, structurally unequal, unequal in that the labs and the resources are primarily based in the global north. Many of the samples um, from human remains are being taken from countries in the global south. And towards the end of my talk, I'd really like to talk about what that means in terms of the responsibilities of all of us who do this research. Um, so what started to happen, um, as, as this sort of ancient DNA, if we want to call it revolution, um, exploded is, is there was just a rapid growth in publication. Um, but these publications overwhelmingly have focused on Europe, that's in red here, and then to a lesser extent, North and Central Asia in purple. Um, and as you'll see, Africa, oh, my Zoom window is kind of covering this. Um, Africa um, ha had been very sort of marginally represented in ancient DNA studies. Um, so again, what, what kind of prompted this growth um, is a number of methodological shifts. I'm happy to talk about them in the Q&A, but basically this makes it, um, you know, sort of following Moore's law for technology, right? Easier, faster, and cheaper to sequence ancient DNA. And again, that discovery of the Petrus portion of the temporal bone um, as a really um, excellent reserve of DNA, even in tropical environments, was very important. At the same time, each person has only two Petrus portions in their body. And of course, each archeological human being um, has at best two, some skeletons only preserve one, some skeletons preserve none, and a rush to sample Petrus has been noted around the world and including in Africa. Um, and that's a huge problem that again, we'll, we can talk about. Um, so I wanna sort of zero in on a couple of case studies. And, and of course, I wanna point out that I don't do any of this work alone. That would be absolutely impossible. Um, I work with a really large team. And in fact, this is a fraction of the people on that team, but these are the most centrally involved um, people that we've been working with who include geneticists um, like Mark Lipson and David Reich, who are um, both at, at Harvard University, um, museum curators, including Emmanuel Ndiema, Chaila Manfi, and Christina Gola at the National Museums of Kenya, Agnes Gidna and Alex Mabula at the National Museums of Tanzania and University of Dar es Salaam, and Maggie Katongo, um, who is a curator at the Livingstone Museum, but is now a graduate student here with me at Rice University. Um, and then of course there's me and uh, bioarchaeologist Elizabeth Sachuk, who I mentioned earlier at the University of Alberta. Um, and then of course there's many, many others um, involved. If you've seen any of the papers that have emerged from this, we have dozens and dozens of co-authors and I'm happy to talk about what that looks like as well, um, because I think it's actually really important to think about the ways in which you work with specialists in many different disciplines and try to come up with a coherent narrative in under 3,500 words that does justice to the people whose histories you're studying. And it is not easy. 
Um, and I would love to talk about that process in the Q&A because I think that's the most challenging part of all of this. Um, so this um, image is from a recent review that we, we are just publishing in the Oxford uh, Research Encyclopedia of African History. And so if you're interested in this, um, not to sort of self promote by any means, but uh, there aren't that many reviews available right now of the literature. And this one is currently up to date. And actually, now that I say that, already out of date um, because a paper was published a month ago that, that is not included in these figures. Um, but I'd be happy to share that chapter with people if they're interested in kind of a um, uh, uh, sort of encyclopedia style, very, very general review. Um, uh, so um, yeah, Bonnie, I'm happy to send it to you. Just shoot me an email and, and I'll send it out. I, I right now have the proofs, but not the final version. Um, so um, on the left, what you see is a um, map showing all published ancient genomes from people who lived in Africa at various times, the dates at which um, these people lived, uh, approximate, of course, within the era of radiocarbon, are presented here. Um, and then this is sort of a global view, similar to what I've already shown you, um, of just how much research has been done in Europe and Asia relative to the African continent. Um, the, I, I, something I guess I haven't talked about, but I'm happy to do in the Q&A is why there's been so much work done in Europe and Asia relative to the African continent. Um, I don't wanna, I, I'm worried about sort of overdoing my, my time here. So I, I won't get into that right now, but th there's a lot of uh, pretty clear reasons for that. Um, and so obviously when you look at this, map and when you look at this bar chart, what I hope you see is the immense patchiness of this data, right? Both spatial patchiness and temporal patchiness. Um, and we are at a stage in ancient DNA research in Africa where each new study has the potential to really change our understanding precisely because so little is known. Um, but we, that also means that we're always um, in danger of being wrong about whatever we publish. Um, and again, I'm happy to sort of talk about that in the Q&A. And I think that's why it's so important to listen to archeologists and linguists and historians when they say, this doesn't work quite with the data that we have. So a classic example of that is the Mota Cave study in Ethiopia, um, which when initially published met quite a bit of, um, uh, what's the word, befuddlement from the archeological community because what was published initially just didn't make sense with what we knew from a century of archeological research in Africa. Um, and I'm grossly oversimplifying the story right now to keep it short, but um, Pontus Skoglund, a geneticist um, who at the time was a, a postdoctoral um, researcher went back into the data. So one great thing I think about ancient DNA research is that the ancient DNA community has made their data openly accessible and, and there are pitfalls to that, which we can talk about. But one of the benefits is that Pontus was able to go back into that data, rerun some numbers and basically say there was a, a, a computer error, right? Like a data entry error or coding error. Um, and your conclusions actually look a bit different um, and communicated this to the authors of the paper. And the authors went back and said, oh, wow, yeah, let's redo this. And they changed the title of the paper, changed some parts of the abstract and some parts of the text. Um, there's a retraction published, not a retraction, that's not the right word, a correction published. Um, and the new findings are much more in line with what archeologists would expect. So this is a really good example of where you just sort of need to be listening and, and talking to others outside your discipline because we're still at an early stage in this research where, where I'm, I'm always worried. Um, and, I, and I think I have very well-founded worries about you know, what happens if we discover that, that our model is wrong or, or other models are, are equally valid. Um, so, um, I, oh, I did actually, I, I forgot that I did include a few things explaining here the differences between um, Africa and the rest of the world. Why do we have these big gaps? Um, it's not just that, that genetic research has been biased, archeological research has been biased over centuries. So one reason why we've been able to do so much work in the Rift Valley is because since the 1920s and 30s, especially with the Leakies, there has been a tremendous amount of archeological research in the Rift Valley. Um, obviously preservation is a huge issue um, and the best preservation has been occurring in highland environments and in caves and rock shelters. 
Um, then of course, there's the question of accessibility of collections themselves. Um, and I should also point out that the gaps that you're seeing here also mirror some gaps that we have in DNA from people living today. So that was kind of a longish introduction to the, the project, but um, I'm just gonna briefly highlight two papers. Um, there are others, but I thought these might be the two most relevant to the Rift Valley Network. One came out um, very recently, just in February. Um, and there's a, a piece on it in the conversation that we wrote um, that um, kind of distills it in case you're interested in that. Um, and I did this work um, very closely with Jessica Thompson at Yale University and again, Elizabeth Sawchuk. Um, and um, we sequenced the genomes of people who had lived anywhere between 20,000 and 5,000 years ago. And that's, that's really kind of amazing because if you look at the gap back here in that slide I showed you, that was kind of precisely the gap we had, right? So as I said, this has not been updated to reflect that most recent paper. We have individuals from Mulan Balasi Rock Shelter in Tanzania dating to between 20 and 16,000 years ago, pushing this back quite a bit. Um, we have individuals from sites in Malawi uh, dating to about, um, if I recall correctly, 16 to 14,000 years ago. So this area here that's off the chart um, is now being captured by these ancient individuals. Then we have other individuals, including from Kisese Rock Shelter, which you heard about recently from Katie Ranhorn, um, dating to about 6,000 or 7,000 years ago. Um, uh, and from Kalemba Rock Shelter in Zambia. And I probably have all of these sites on another slide, so forgive me for going back to this one. Um, but I just wanna kind of point out that one thing that we, we really talked about in this paper is that we were breaking, um, as Jessica Thompson called it, I thought this was a great phrase, the tropical ceiling, right? And sort of saying, well, in the tropics, you can study the Pleistocene through ancient DNA. It's just a question of, having excellent preservation and excellent um, methodology. Um, and so the questions that we were really trying to address here were about um, what uh, the genetic uh, sort of, I don't love the word landscape, demoscape I would say looked like prior to the spread of food production because one thing that's pretty well established archeologically, of course, linguistically and uh, now genetically is that the spread of, of food production, both livestock herding and farming, which of course took place in um, multiple times in, in multiple processes across the continent, had a tremendous impact on the demography of the continent. And Corinna Schleber should all have a paper. Corinna's work, by the way, if you're looking for other review papers is excellent. And she's published a number of great review papers recently, including with Matthias Jakobsen, um, Mario Vicente. So that's another person whose scholarship I would look to um, for excellent reviews about what all of this means. Um, and um, uh, so her, this figure that she designed and which has since shown up in a number of publications is basically showing that there's very deep structure as we call it um, in African populations prior to the spread of food production. And then that spread of food production leads to the spread of new kinds of ancestry across the continent very recently, um, meaning that it can be quite difficult to detect some of the genetic ancestries and structures that existed previously. Um, a question I was really interested in going into this is, so as again, as a zooarchaeologist, I've, I've worked quite a bit on the archeology span of hunter-gatherer fishers in Eastern Africa, especially fishing communities around Lake Turkana and Lake Victoria. Um, and there's quite different traditions of making ceramics and of um, making fishing tools and of hunting and gathering and fishing that um, lead to a lot of diversity, even within just the region, including present day Kenya and Tanzania. And what I wanted to better understand was the extent to which those regional traditions mapped onto genetic diversity. So that, that was a key question I had going into this. Um, other people going into this were more interested in deep human origins. So of course, in all of these papers, you're trying to kind of bring together a lot of different questions from different partners. Um, so we, again, analyzed um, the DNA of people who had lived in um, present day Zambia, Malawi, um, and Tanzania, and then combined that data against data from people um, whose genomes had been published 
in earlier papers across the continent, right? So kind of taking any and all relevant um, data that we could to reconstruct the largest data set yet available for ancient African foragers. Um, and what we found, and, and, and again, I'm not gonna go into a very deep dive here, but one, one figure that I think illustrates this well is a classic genetic PCA um, in which you can see that the genetic structure that we observed, hopefully you can see my mouse here, maps quite neatly onto geographic structure. So what you're meant to sort of, what the eye is meant to observe here is that this PCA um, is actually mapping really neatly onto a map of our samples. And honestly, it's not terribly surprising that people would have children with people who live closest to them rather than people who live thousands of miles away. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense to, that you would see that geography is the greatest predictor of genetic variation. But of course we do find cases where that, that's not true, right? So the classic example would be the spread of West African related ancestry across the continent in the last 2000 years. So it's interesting to see this sort of hyper locality. But another thing that we were able to tease out of the data is a three-way climb where basically the ancestry of the individuals in our study in Kenya, Tanzania, and Malawi, and Zambia, their ancestry could be best captured in a three-way mixture of what we call um, ancestry related to both present and ancient Eastern African hunter-gatherers using the individual from Mota as a proxy, present um, uh, you know, central, present day Central African hunter-gatherers using um, uh, genomes from um, present day Mbuti as a proxy, and both ancient and present day um, Southern African foragers. Um, and so what this means is that, um, and, and again, this is, I'm, I'm not getting into the weeds on the statistical tests we used, but sometime between about 80 and 50,000 years ago, people whose ancestors had long been diverged, right? So people with what we call Eastern African ancestry, Western African ancestry, um, sorry, Eastern African ancestry, Central African ancestry, and Southern African ancestry, their ancestors met about 50 to 80,000 years ago, implying there were very different patterns of movement and um, what geneticists call admixture or what I would call reproductive sex and all the social things tied up in that, 80 to 50,000 years ago than there are more recently. So people's ancestors were moving and mixing in different ways across really long distances. Um, after about 20,000 years ago, we no longer see evidence for that admixture. People are very much living locally and having kids with those who live closest to them. Um, this is sort of another way of visualizing those different ancestry components I mentioned, Eastern, um, Central and Southern African ancestry. I'm gonna sort of skip over this for time just to get to the quick, the, the most important thing, which is what does this mean? Um, and uh, really what I wanna emphasize today is the extent to which we can blend genetic data with archeology span and potentially with linguistic data, though I realize now I'm talking at time scales that, that might make this difficult. Although um, Kate DeLuna, who's a co-author on this paper, um, and I had really interesting conversations about this. And, and we did talk a little bit about the Eastern to Southern African linguistic connections in the paper, um, but I will stay in my, my lane um, and talk about the archeology span and say that um, we do see long distance movement of raw materials around 50,000 years ago. Again, Katie Ranhorn was just here speaking about ostrich eggshell beads. So, so I know you all know about this already. Um, but we do have these kinds of materials moving across the continent at quite large scales around the exact same time frame. we're finding all this genetic evidence for long distance movement, suggesting that at least initially people are moving with goods, but that once those long distance exchange networks are developed, um, there's a lot less human movement to the point where people are really staying put after about 20,000 years ago. People are staying home, as we say these days. Um, and that is reflected in patterns of gene flow. So that was a really, I thought, quite nice example of, of where the archeology span and the genetics lined up. And then the second case study, and, and the one that um, perhaps is more, of more interest to you as, as Rift Valley folks, um, uh, because it really was 100% centered in, in the Rift Valley of Eastern Africa, is the piece that we published in 2019 um, 
And this was really my, my key um, focus in this project um, was focusing on the origins of African foodways. Again, as a zooarchaeologist, those are the those are the sort of questions I came into the project with is looking at the movements of animals. I also want to say plants, even though the plant record is archeologically so complicated um, and ideas. Um, and of course, this question of whether or not, um, you know, it's been long hypothesized that those ceramic traditions I showed you earlier, Savannah Pastoral Neolithic and Elman Titan um, represent different groups, right? Chris Arrett, for example, I'm sure you're familiar with his argument that these um, traditions represented linguistically distinct groups. Um, we wanted to know whether or not that was something that could actually be supported by the uh, by the genetic data. Um, it's a question archaeologists have often been either skeptical or confused about. Um, and then, of course, I'm really interested in the extent to which foragers and herders are interacting with each other across potential social and economic boundaries. And um, we were interested in genetic adaptations to new diets as well, since we know that lactase persistence or the ability to digest milk into adulthood emerges in Eastern Africa, um, potentially around the time of the pastoral Neolithic. Um, a side sort of note about this research that I think is important is that this also led us down multiple rabbit holes, but one of them is the rabbit hole of provenience and provenance. Um, and a lot of the work Elizabeth Sachuk and I have been doing and will continue to do out of this project is talking about the fact that um, there's really poor provenance and provenience data for many of the people whose remains are curated in museum collections. There are problems with um, human remains having been taken from the countries of origins um, and um, are awaiting repatriation. In some cases, just crania were taken, um, leading to the severing of a person's body in two different collections on two different continents. Um, and again, that may be the subject of a whole separate talk, but once you start to go down this um, hole, you discover, well, you, you remember how um, violent the history of our field is um, and how much, um, uh, how much restitution is required to do this work. Um, and you realize it's very difficult to do this work without engaging in conversations about repatriation. So again, that's maybe a topic for the Q&A, um, but I think that, that's sort of something that has really emerged from this work and something that we'll continue to, to talk about. And we have some publications planned on this. In the end, we wound up sampling individuals um, only in African countries, so Kenya, Tanzania, and Zambia, that were relevant to these questions. Um, and often we were frustrated with the contextual information that we had. So this is, for example, a note accompanying the burial of one person. This is a sketch map of the burial itself. And I mean, it's comical, but also really sad that this person's remains are now being curated in perpetuity in a museum, and this is as much as we know about them. Um, we found stuff like this all the time where the greatest clue we might have to something, I mean, this is actually pretty good. We've got the name of a site, which has been mentioned in some publications. Um, we have some contextual information. We have the naming of a person um, and we have a date after which this note must have been done. So uh, this is the kind of stuff we were often dealing with and it was quite difficult. And it led us to a conversation with curators about whether or not it was more ethical to leave orphaned and underdocumented collections alone completely, or to try to find out more about them, even if it means destructive analysis. Um, and in conversation with curators, we not always, but often opted to try to learn more um, because curators wanted to better understand what was in the collection and saw um, in particular radiocarbon dating as a, as a key way of doing that. And so I'm gonna focus just on two examples of times where um, and I see maybe I only have like five minutes and then I should stop talking for the q and I think. And, and if I'm wrong about that, please somebody let me know. Um, but otherwise I'll try to wrap up in five minutes. Um, uh, so two, two examples of cases where we really didn't know as much as we would have liked about these ancient people and through research we've learned more. Um, one is a site called Pret John's Gully. This was not even known as an archeological site. It was a geological trench. So this is an example of geotrenching, um, which is done for the purposes of paleoenvironmental analysis. Um, and this was done in the 1960s by a team 
that included geologists and archaeologists, but it was never published as an archaeological site, so nobody knew it existed. Um, and upon finding human remains in these trays, um, we were surprised and we got in touch with some of the archaeologists who are still alive, including Charles Nelson, who kindly sent us this image. Um, and tried to learn as much as we could about the site. We really didn't learn very much. Um, and it's one of these sites that we're still trying to do provenance research on so that we can publish something focused only on it. And that might require going back and excavating uh, at least a witness section. Um, but to our surprise, this wound up being um, a pretty important site in our study. So this is again, another genetic PCA. Um, and what I wanna focus on here are these individuals, these two data points from that site. Um, the radiocarbon dates were surprisingly early. This is about a thousand years earlier than the spread of herding in the central rift valley of Kenya around, um, this is between Lakes Nakuru and Naivasha. Um, and if you look at the so-called PN cluster, so a cluster of individuals, these are all people associated with pastoral Neolithic traditions in Kenya and Tanzania. The two individuals from Pret John's Gully stand out in important ways. So again, without spending a ton of time on this, I just wanna say that two key things that came out of the study were, we had people in the central rift who genetically look close, but not super close to pastoral Neolithic herders about a thousand years earlier than we have concrete evidence for herding in the rift. And those individuals are different in ways that led us to suspect there had been multiple spreads of pastoralism into the Central Rift Valley. So that was an important finding for us. And the second example of ways in which these sort of old collections can lead to new discoveries was the site of Gishamangeda in Lake Ayasi, a place I know many of you are familiar with. Um, and this is a great example of how, how archaeology shouldn't be done. Um, we have extremely little provenance research um, for pro provenience, sorry, data on these individuals. So their, their exact um, resting place in the site of Gishamangeda Cave because of the way in which the site was excavated and documented. So this is the best map that we have of those people. And this map doesn't include all of the people whose remains were excavated from the site. Um, <clears throat> this was part of a paper that was had a very different mission to what um, we might do today, which was looking at living people, Hadza and Iraq, um, in uh, ways that were very much sort of um, informed by uh, racial typology studies of the early 20th century. And as part of that sort of craniometric work, um, people were excavated from the Gishimangeda cave site to provide a comparative sample to present day Hadza who lived in the area. And there's a lot of problems with that approach um, as I'm sure is obvious to all of you. Um, and so because this wasn't excavated with explicitly archeological questions in mind, archeologists know remarkably little about this important site. Um, here is the site today, it's almost completely filled in. Context information is, is largely absent. Um, and when we encountered the human remains from the site, they were largely commingled. Um, Elizabeth Sawchuk did the lion's share of the work for this as part of her dissertation and post-dissertation, trying to, at the very least, sort out um, individual burials so that people's remains could be put back together as a whole person in their curatorial state. You know, we talk a lot about the post-mortem lives of um, the people that we study and, and one way of you know, perhaps providing at least some measure of dignity here is to sort of uh, at least treat the remains that we find with respect, curate them carefully, um, and hope that that therefore they'll sort of be um, uh, given some measure of, of care. Um, and so I'm just going to warn you that on the next slide, although they're not terribly visible, human remains will be a bit visible. Um, what we did as part of this work before we could even begin sampling for ancient DNA is to curate the individuals, um, ignore what's written on the trays in chalk here, um, in individual trays so that each person was housed in a tray. And that was a tremendous amount of work. Um, it wasn't explicitly part of the ancient DNA project, um, and we could have simply gone in and taken samples and left. But this was also a way of giving back to the museum, 
who's deeply invested in learning more about their collections and often doesn't have the time or the staff to do this kind of work. Um, and that site also wound up being incredibly important. There are 11 individuals whose genomes were sequenced from that site. There are at least 18 people who were buried in that site, so far more than were originally documented by the original excavators. Um, and what's really interesting about those individuals is those that date have radiocarbon dates falling into the pastoral Neolithic era cluster in this so-called PN pastoral Neolithic cluster where many of our ancient herders look genetically similar. The undated individuals cluster over here, or I should say are spread out over here among other people who are associated with hunting and gathering. So that was really interesting and raises all sorts of questions. Elizabeth and I are currently exploring in a paper about who these people were and why they were buried in the same site and not necessarily at the same time. So I, I, I kind of wanna stop there and I'm actually gonna sort of skip ahead. I'm gonna skip over a bunch of slides that I wasn't sure I'd have time for. Um, and indeed I don't. Um, and just talk briefly, and, and hopefully this will spark some discussion about the ways in which this research has been um, contested in ways that I think are really useful um, for the most part. And I'm sure you're very aware of this debate already. Um, there's a lot of discussion. Uh, these are just a handful of recent papers globally, of course, now I'm sort of zooming out to the whole world about the challenges of interdisciplinarity. Um, and I just wanna point out again, that just like how ancient DNA is not new, per se, neither are these discussions. There are papers going back to the 1990s um, talking about these issues. So um, the conversations we're having are not new. I do think they've taken on a new tenor in the world in which we live today, um, but these are old debates. Um, and when you, if you read these papers in, in depth, um, you can, and there are more that I have not included here, you can easily become sort of overwhelmed by the diversity of perspectives articulated. And so I like to kind of break them down into three things. Um, one, I think is a set of concerns about who are the stakeholders in this research. There are many different, um, and different stakeholders with potentially very different views on how this research should be conducted. Um, I've listed some of them here and I'm certainly overlooking others. Um, and of course I've not included linguists because I usually am focused on archeology span and giving this talk for archeologists, but you guys are stakeholders as well. So are historians. Um, and so are of course, most importantly, the communities that, that we all work with. Um, uh, a lot of the concerns have been methodological. Um, in some ways, those are the easier concerns to address because it's easy to sort of talk about best practices and, and Elizabeth Sachuk and I have done this a bit and sort of advanced a series of guidelines we think should um, govern sampling. Um, a number of other groups, some of which I'm part of and some I'm not part of, have also come out with guidelines in the past few years. So in some ways, I think methodology, we are advancing on that front. Um, there's still plenty of debate about how to do this work right, but I think at least we're having the right conversations. And then perhaps the one that um, touches the most nerves and is, I think, hardest to wrap our head around is um, the interdisciplinarity of this work and the ways in which we're coming at this with different research questions and different goals um, and different degrees of engagement with the public. Um, and I think there's a lot of danger in the way in which ancient DNA research can get weaponized. Um, we've seen this happen in far right chat rooms and, and, and blogs in ways that are horrifying. Um, at a more simplest, at, at a, a sort of more general level, you see this play out even in just sort of mainstream media, the ways in which ancient DNA studies are reported on, um, and the, the very real dangers in the ways in which ancient DNA narratives can get weaponized um, for, for political gain. So I, those are kind of the three key issues, and I think I want to stop there, and uh, maybe I'll sort of leave that particular, how do I do this? Um, leave that particular slide up so that we can look at it and, and unshare my screen so I can see all of you. Um, but that's kind of a, oh no, then you can't see my slide if I unshare my screen. That's okay. Um, maybe that's a good place for me to stop so that we can just kind of talk about some of the issues that I've raised. I really don't want to go over time. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how much time I had. So apologies if I've already gone over, but I'll, I'll leave it there and open it up for questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mary, for this really interesting presentation. Yeah, we can jump straight in with the Q&A. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can either raise your hand with the controls underneath the participant panel, or you can put it in the chat or read it out as always. Uh, please remember that uh, the webinars are being recorded. So if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and released on YouTube. And I see Bonnie Sands has raised her hand, so I'll go straight to her. Hi. Thanks so much for the talk. It was very clear and uh, very helpful. Um, so uh, let me start with two quick questions. One, foodways, um, our end farmers are not very well sampled in the present or in the past. Um, you know, it was very exciting to see the Mota data, and the Ari blacksmiths versus the Ari, but Omotic just as a whole is so linguistically diverse and um, you know, I'm old and remember the studies where they'd say we have 17 Ethiopians in our sample and I'd be like, ah, you know, we have no idea what that means linguistically. Ethiopia is so linguistically diverse. That's my first really quick point. And the second is part of the temporal bone. I had to Google that because I don't know what it is. I see that it houses the inner ear. And I'm just wondering, do people study the structure of that to understand the evolution of hearing? Because so often we look at how Neanderthals spoke and what their hyoid bone did, but I want to know how did they hear because that can influence the sound structure. So two totally different uh, comments, but I'm wondering if you could address those. Sure, yeah, let me take, and I, you broke up a little bit in the first comment, I couldn't quite hear you, but let me do the second one first, and I'll go back to the first one. The second one, that is such an excellent question. I'm gonna disappoint you because I don't know the answer. I, I think, I can, I can come up with a couple of people who would be worth asking. Um, Christina Ponce de Leon, Isabel Crevecourt, those are two names that come to mind. Um, it, there has been a bunch of work done on the morphology of the Petrus bone. Um, and one thing that people have realized is the importance of doing micro CT scanning before destructive analysis, because we can learn a lot from inner ear structure. So for example, there's been a couple of papers done on the uh, emergence of ear infections and that's something that you can do by looking at the Petrus bone. So I don't know, I can understand why the evolution of hearing would be such a really interesting question. I can't believe that I never thought about it until now. And so I just don't know, I, I do, yeah. I, Isabel Krepkur is the first person who, who pops to my mind. Um, she's at Bordeaux. Um, just because she's somebody I've talked to a bit about Petrus portions, and I know she's worked with students and, and postdocs on micro CT scanning, and um, she's also a person who works on, on human origins research. She, she might just have a good idea of where to go with that question, um, but it's a really excellent one, and I think it underscores why we need to think about, so one thing Elizabeth and I made sure to do is make sure that you're not sampling all the Petrus, you're leaving, you know, never sample both Petrus from a single individual. My God, I can't believe this has happened, but it has. Um, and sometimes that has happened because people don't do the basic bio, bioarchaeological work first, which takes a lot of time to sit, separate out individuals in collections. And if you don't have a trained bioarchaeologist with you, you can't do that, right? And Elizabeth is a trained bioarchaeologist. I'm not. I wouldn't have done that work if, if I were sampling on my own. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your simple question, but if that's why it's so important to sort of do the bio arc work um, before simply sampling. Um, and then to your first question, I, which I, I missed part of it, but in terms of thinking about food waste, so one thing I always, I, I try to, I do wind up using the terms forager and herder and farmer a lot, and then try to remember to qualify this because my training as a zooarchaeologist tells me very well that some people may herd in one season and hunt and gather in an off season and, you know, single individuals, let alone groups and across seasons are changing up their ways of life. And so we have to be really careful about how we use those terms. And you mentioned Ethiopian language diversity. There's a lot of research happening in Ethiopia right now. In fact, you probably saw this paper that just came out recently um, by Lopez uh, et al. And then there's another one by Gopalan et al. Um, there's a lot going on in the genetic sphere in Ethiopia. There will be more research coming out and actually, I would love to know who are the linguists we should be talking to about this research, right? So Bonnie- Me if you, if and Mara Tosco, who will be in that. Flagstaff next month. 
So maybe we should have that conversation over email at some point, because although I'm not directly, I'm not super involved in this research, I know people who are, and it would be beneficial to them to talk to you. So yeah, um, so not only that, that's exactly there, why we're here, right? Yeah, the language groups, but there are all the former hunter gatherer groups like the Waito hippo hunters who now just speak Amharic, but you know, I don't know that they've been sampled. I know Shabo have been sampled, but I don't know that, that their data have been in a lot of the re more recent publications. Um, even the no, Almolo, it's in who you at all. Yeah. Oh, or maybe okay. Lopez at all. Yeah, I, it's in one of those two. It's either Gopalan at all, or I think it's Gopalan at all, which was a paper that had been in pre-press for a very, very long time. So people were kind of using it, but then this is the issue too, right? With, you know, scale of time, sales and publication, it just came out. Yeah, and I and I don't mean to hijack the discussion period, but I mean I know there's some bangi may, and this is the language of Mali, that uh, DNA that's again not published but in pre-publication. But I've never seen anything on lol. So there are language isolates across the continent that have not yet been sampled. And yeah, so I'd I'd love to uh, have more input yeah. on that. Absolutely. And also I think, you know, so I always like to stress, I only, I only work on ancient DNA and, and ancient people. And um, the group I work with at, right, at um, David Reich's lab only also do ancient DNA. And then another issue, a separate issue is the sampling of people living today, um, which is being done by other groups, but we often use their data for comparison, right? So that's, Another issue too is that these are things are happening in different labs and then we're depending on everybody to share data and talk to each other. I see that also Marta Mouse has raised his hand, so asking next to mute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, that was overwhelming. Uh, Sorry. Thoroughly, <laughs> <laughs> no, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and on this last point, yes, uh, in, in our project, we are looking a little bit to South Omotic because we're not so sure whether that's really part of Omotic or Afroasiatic. So I would be interested in that, but that's just a remark. Now, my question is, is um, yeah, something about, I mean, there the are uh, um, old, there's ancient uh, bones uh, uh, in, in, in these museums uh, in East Africa. Well, I'm interested in East Africa. What I wonder is what, what, what is there to come? What is happening now? Is, is, uh, is, is this just a tiny little bit of, of all the potential that of the material that still could be used and or and and how how are people choosing what um, what kind of material to use um, that that is what what I'm really interested in yeah that's a very good question so our procedure has always been to sample a fraction of what we could sample um, that's not that's not always everybody's approach. And um, our approach has also been question driven. So we've tried to start off with an archeological question, identify the sites relevant to that archeological question and then sample the individuals relevant to that site. And along the way, what we often found as the case with Pret Johns, right? Is like, there's this other site that we didn't know existed in your collection. Um, and in talking with um, Christine and Emmanuel um, and Chyla Manthe, you know, there was, they also were like, what is this? And how old is it? And can you guys find out more? So um, how many more sites like that are there? Not, not many in the National Museums of Kenya and Tanzania, because I think that we've now done a very thorough inventory, but there are many other museums out there. And we have tried to sample extremely conservatively. So we always took two samples from each person, one that we would sample and one that was a backup in the event that the first sample failed, but we thought we had a high probability of success. And almost every single backup was returned. We simply didn't sample them. So um, we basically, a tiny fraction of what we could have been doing has been done. That said, I don't know why you would need to sample more than one bone from a person. Um, and then of course, there's the question of all that material in London and Cambridge and Tubingen that needs to be repatriated um, and that's not being sampled. Um, and, and perhaps shouldn't be um, without repatriation. I mean, there's a whole conversation there that's a complicated mm -hmm. conversation. Um, and, um, and then of course, I'm really focused on one particular area and 
I guess a question that's come up a lot is, is there justification for doing new excavations aimed at burial mm -hmm. sites where your goal is to not necessarily excavate? I mean, I actually, I don't excavate burials and I never want to. Um, I'm not a trained bioarchaeologist um, and I would work with other experts like Elizabeth Sawchuk on that. Um, but could you do targeted excavation aimed at recovering only a small portion of bone and respecting the burial and reburying? Um, and I think the answer is yes, you could do that. Um, and maybe that's something that will happen in the future. Um, but also many of these burial sites are really complicated taphonomically. So like the burial sites in Turkana that Kate Grillo and Lisa Hildebrand and Elizabeth Sotchak have been excavating are palimpsests of many different burial events. And it would be really difficult to do that kind of work. So new excavation is kind of a whole nother Pandora's mm. box. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly more work to be done. And every time I'm sort of like, well, we understand the PN now we're good. I remember that, you know, look at Bronze Age Germany. There's like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of genomes that have been sequenced, but I think the issues are quite different. And I, I think we need to go really slowly and carefully when we're doing this research in, in East Africa. So, sorry, I don't want to overtake. I know there's other questions coming up, but I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. I just want to um, check with you, Mary. So you said you might have to travel. It's already the whole hour. Like, do you have more time for yeah. questions? Or? I can, yeah, I can hold it. I'm going to drive very fast. I can probably do make 10, 10 more minutes and then I'll, and then okay. I'll go. Yeah, then I'll so I, have to, I have to drive to Waco. Yeah, from Andrew, which I saw in the chat, which is, uh, he says, I'm interested in hearing a bit more about the ethics of ancient DNA. If an ancient individual is uncovered during archaeological work, what are the initial steps that people would take now? What are the major concerns? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I'm, again, thankfully not, I'm not aiming to excavate burial sites. Um, uh, but I work closely with people who do. And so I can tell you a little bit based on what I know from their experience and also from what happened with me and Kate Grillo when we were at Lux Manda. And as I think all of you who were at her talk will know, we uncovered these like amazing grinding stones and they're plant processing stones and um, don't seem to be associated with any human remains. Um, but the very first thing we did, the first thing we thought when we saw a lot of stones in the ground was could this be a burial cairn? And so the first thing we did was we walked, we, we drove around and we walked around and we talked to as many people as we could, including the landowners and elders in the village who had memories of who had lived on that land and when and how it had been used. And nobody had any sort of reference for understanding this material as a burial. Everybody said, this has always been a farm. It's never been used as a burial site. And nobody looked at the cairn and said, we brought people to the site to see it. And nobody said, oh, you know, that this sort of jogs my memory as a burial tradition. So that was first and foremost, was talking to, to local people. Um, and I know up at Jaragole in Turkana, where there is a known burial site, and Elizabeth Sachuk is leading those excavations, she's working extremely closely with local community groups to do the excavation. So she's involving community groups in research design, um, in thinking about how the excavations will proceed and how information will be disseminated. So first and foremost, community engagement. Obviously, second is thinking about authorities, right? And who are the appropriate authorities in country to authorize that work. Um, and then if, if, if ancient DNA research is to proceed, and that's an if, then I think what you always wanna do is sort of maximize chances of success while minimizing chances of destruction. And so what that has meant in Turkana, for example, and again, this is what I know from my colleagues, I'm not doing this work myself. It meant sampling with mask, gloves, you know, full PPE, um, something we're all familiar with now, uh, personal protective equipment, and then um, transporting the remains in a cooler on ice, which if you've ever been to Lake Turkana, you'll know is not easy. Um, and ensuring maximum DNA recovery. And the other thing I guess I would stress, I'm sort of all over the place because there are so many things, is you would never do this research without an MOU, so a memorandum of understanding between the institutions involved, not between people because people you know, leave the field or die and all sorts of things, but between institutions um, that sort of spells out how the work will be done, who the stakeholders are who will be engaged in this work and how the samples 
once analyzed will be returned. And that is so important because we talk all the time about getting export permits for archeological material and we never talk enough or budget enough for return and curation. So those are kind of some of the initial steps that, that I would highlight. And, and there are probably others um, that I've not even mentioned, right? So for example, collecting oral histories that might be relevant, but those are a handful. Thank you, Dan. I just, um, the chat is quite full with a lot of references. Uh, Bonnie had a few comments. These are so useful. Just raised her hand, so I'll just ask her to unmute. Yeah, I could just kind of summarize mine as saying the genetic diversity, linguistic diversity of Nilo Saharan is hugely underappreciated. And many groups like Kuliak, which Eric calls RUB, you know, are not even considered Nilo Saharan by some specialists. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's nothing we can do about uh, sampling in Kordofan and, and hills in Darfur. I mean, there's not easy areas to get to, uh, but they might have good ancient DNA. But uh, you know, when we're, mm. I, it, just to give perspective, uh, just say, uh, maybe uh, Martin can help me out here. Eastern Cushitic, I would say even just uh, say Highland East Cushitic might be considered comparable to Germanic or Romance. You know, so we're not even at the level of comparing Southern and Eastern Cushitic, much less Southern Eastern Cushitic and Omotic. And within Nilo-Saharan, you know, just Northeast, is it what they call that branch northeast nilo saharan you know is like comparable to indo-european in terms of diversity so when you know like a lot of people don't think gumus i think there is now some data on gumus um, dna a lot of people don't even think gumus is nilo saharan and yet if it is nilo saharan it's so you know at a, <laughs> at a deep time scale when you're comparing to more familiar language families like Indo-European, it would be like, yeah, dealing with Turkmen mummies or something. <laughs> right, and so, okay. Mummies. So what you're saying kind of raises something that, that I've wrestled with a lot in these papers, which is the, a discussion that David Reich and I have had a lot is to what extent do we want our papers, which are genetic data, ancient genetic data in comparison to present day genetic data, to say something about archeology, span linguistics, history, other lines of evidence. Um, and David is much of the view, and, and I think I'm starting to agree with him that the genetic data could stand alone in a paper with sort of minimal interpretation from other lines of evidence so that it's kind of clean, and then leave this for the linguists, the archeologists and others to write papers engaging with that data because there's just a greater risk of error when you're doing these syntheses, but you don't have, you're working at different time scales, spatial scales, and you don't have the whole picture. And I'm starting to really agree with that perspective. Although at the same time, I guess we've made our papers hyper archeological um, because I also want archeologists to, to sort of see the links and the, uh, the really interesting differences too between our lines of evidence. Um, but you're bringing up a really good point, which is that with the herding paper, the 2019 paper, um, we really wrestled with the extent to which we should even include reference to linguistics. And as you probably know, archaeologists working in the Rift Valley only cite Chris Eretz's work. Um, and that's a deficient, that, that's a deficit on our part because we don't know the literature and we're not trained in it. And so if there's other work we should be aware of, we're not. And, and that's our fault and we need to work better with linguists on this. Um, but uh, there's sort of this cyclical self-citing thing and or not self-citing but citing the same things that happens over and over again um and i was really hesitant about including any references to any linguistic work in that paper and in the end we kind of threw in if you look in the paper you'll find it but it's it's sort of a side note and sort of an area for further exploration these um potential overlaps between um linguistic patterns and genetic patterns and Maybe what we're all kind of saying here is that we need to work together more closely and have papers that do this in a much more rigorous way. It's pretty hard to do so in 3,500 word papers. Um, and I think that that's where there's scope for having an interdisciplinary paper that looks at the literature that's out there and then says, okay, here's the huge gaps or, or mistakes or oversimplifications from a linguistic perspective or an archeological perspective. And here's where the research needs to go. And here are the specific geographic areas or timeframes we think you need to focus on in the future. 
Yes, now I am. Sorry, no, I, I, I have much full sympathy for that, for what you say. I mean, I think we have a, a and uh, we, have to, we have to look for new ways of, uh, of, of how we talk to each other how, and, and how we publish in, 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 in science. I mean, if I'm, I'm now all into the discussions of the end of the 19th century, where you see that with the paper, you get a lot of discussion published and things are published within a year after people have collected their, their, their data. We are very far away from, from that. And so I... Um, we, we don't have enough, uh, we, we have this, which I really love, but uh, and we, we have discussions on, on uh, uh, media, but we, we need something which is still a kind of monitored scientific forum and where we can have more uh, uh, discussion rather than trying to put a little bit of uh, in, in, a, in a paper and then it's not reviewed by the linguist or by the archaeologist and, and, and it may be nonsense and still stays there and, and yeah so I think we are, yeah. We, yeah, we are looking for, for those kind of venues. Yeah absolutely and I think it has to do with how we're training our students too right like I've never taken a linguistics course in my life right and I recognize this as a huge blind spot in my knowledge um, and, and, you know, the next paper we're going to work on, um, Kate DeLuna was involved in our most recent paper, will be more involved in the next paper. So um, I'm hoping that, that that will help address, you know, what are my own deficiencies and certainly the deficiencies of, you know, the geneticists I work with are not linguists either. But what we really need, and maybe this is like a workshop, a conference, is to get people all together at the same table and explaining their perspectives to each other because uh, I'll be the first to admit, like I don't have that perspective. Um, and I, I mean, I have to thank Andrew, right? Because that's what this forum is, and and you know, it's it's really helping create those conversations. So, but but those conversations also need to happen in a bigger space where more people will will know about them, especially in the genetic and archaeological world. Thank you. Um, and a good argument for independence. I mean, I I consult on a paper quite a long time ago and I felt they weren't listening to me. They were only taking what I said when it agreed with what they wanted to say. And they were not listening to me when I had something that disagreed with what they were saying. So that was incredibly frustrating for me. Sorry. Yeah, that, that, that's also an issue. And uh, having been herder of cats for a few years now on these 60 author papers, I can tell you it's very hard to get 60 people to, to agree with each other. Um, but if somebody is saying the data don't make sense against this line of evidence, then just say that in the paper, right? Like it's okay for the different lines of evidence to not mesh. That's interesting. And that's an avenue for future research. So I'm gonna have to go so that I can go start driving to Waco. I'm really sorry. I've got to take a graduate student of mine over to Baylor today. So I have to start driving and I'm gonna have to go. But this chat is really interesting and I, don't know if I can download it to have time to read I it later, but for you. yeah, if you want to save it to me and then I can try to remember to send like Bonnie was asking for paper and stuff like that way I'll remember later when I'm back at my desk. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll get you a copy. Thank you so much for your time and incredibly interesting discussion and uh, have a good Thank direction. You. Thanks all of you for coming and thanks for the comments. I really appreciate it. So have a great rest of your day and thank you for organizing this, Andrew. Bye. Bye. For all the others, I'll just leave with a comment that the next webinar is going to be on the 20th of April. It's going to be presented by Maarten Maus, and it's titled The Historical Linguistics of Hunter-Gatherers in East Africa, a Discussion. Uh, with that, thanks everyone for participating, and I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Bye, everyone.